I picked up a heap of different PCs off someone for a lot deal. They just wanted to get rid of all the stuff in their house. And one of the cases was very interesting because it had an Optiplex second generation motherboard, which was pulled out of an Optiplex build and a standard power supply, as well as being mounted into a Cooler Master case. And when I first saw this, I was like, okay, someone must have just given up on this build, trying to put it together and get it to work. Because in the past, I have looked at the Optiplex builds and they do have quite a few proprietary connectors on board, which basically means if you don't know how to get around this, sometimes you won't even get the PC to boot. Or of course, even if you get it to boot, you may come into error messages. However, in today's video, I'm gonna be doing my best to get this Optiplex working in a standard ATX case with LED bling and also a standard power supply and see if we can get it to work flawlessly with no error messages. And of course, document all the problems that we come into and how we fix them. And hopefully we get ourselves a really budget, but also crazy price performance rig in the process. Let's get into it. If you've just built a gaming PC and you're getting this annoying Windows needs activation message, even on Windows 11, then today's video sponsor can get rid of that message quick and easily for as little as $12 using the coupon code BFTYC. You can save 35% in the month of November. Links in description below. So the first thing I decided to do was, since this build was also a little bit dirty, I decided to pull all the components out and just try to diagnose how to actually boot up the Dell Optiplex motherboard, especially since a standard ATX case will only have a two pin power switch button. Where on the original Optiplexes, when you pull these out, they've actually got a five pin power switch, which is their own proprietary connector. Though this was quite easy to get around. First thing I did was hook it up to the two left pins and I'll put a diagram up here on the video for you so we can see we've got one, two, three, four, and five. And so if you hook up a power switch to pins one and two, this will enable now the PC to boot up as normal. However, after we've done this, we are met with quite a few error messages, but that said, if we press the F1 key, we can pretty much have a standard gaming PC as it is. So that gives me enough confidence now to put this rig together, at least knowing that it will work. We just have to press the F1 key, of course, if worse comes to worst. So we've now just got the preliminary build finished. And what I'm gonna do now is basically try and install Windows and just run a few stress tests. However, the first problem that I came into with the Dell Optiplexes is that at least this one here, the default configuration actually has it in a RAID setup in the BIOS. And so I've changed this to the AHCI and applied and saved settings. However, after this, I then installed Windows and what happened was it installed the reserve files on the hard drive every single time. And that's because that was the P0 drive. So if you want to install Windows, make sure you put that drive on the SATA port zero. And so that will be on the slot to the right hand side. And so after doing this, Windows then installed not only the install, but also the reserve files to the SSD, which is where I want all the files for my boot drive. However, we still came into a problem after that, and that was where it was still confusing the boot order. So in order to get around this, we then just disabled every other boot device, including the secondary hard drive. And so we've only left with the SSD now in the BIOS to boot from. And lo and behold, this was now working fine in terms of just getting the computer to boot up, pressing F1, and then getting to Windows. So 
I've now just completed some stress testing and everything is looking fine. The CPU is running absolutely fine. We've got 16 gigabytes of DDR3 memory and the Cinebench score, I'll put that up on the screen for you guys. We also ran a Unigine Heaven benchmark with the GTX 780 and that was performing okay as well. So now it's finally time to tackle those four error messages and see if we can just get it straight clean press the power button, boot up to Windows with no issues. So now the first problem we are going to tackle is the air sensor. And this is actually one where if you're pulling apart a Dell Optiplex, make sure you take out this sensor with the pull. So don't only just pull the motherboard out and the RAM and the hard drive, but also make sure you pull out this sensor. I'll pull it up on the screen for you. It plugs in towards the bottom of the motherboard. And this essentially is going to get rid of this error message, but also allow the CPU cooler and the hard drive fan to stay at a quieter noise if the temperatures are lower. So it's also working as a temperature sensor, I believe. And so it's allowing the CPU fan not to get out of control as well as that hard drive fan. But on the note of the hard drive fan, make sure you pull this out as well, because this is the second error we are going to get onto now, where after this first error, it no longer appears after we plug in that sensor, but the hard drive error is the same thing. We just got to plug in that Dell proprietary fan connector on the second fan slot on the motherboard. And since this case, I've already mounted two 120mm LED fans at the front, a 120mm LED fan at the rear, I then have no room left on this case to mount it in normal position since the top of the case actually is enclosed. There's no mounting holes for fans at the top. But we decided to just mount it down at the bottom so it's blowing air up at the graphics card. And this actually worked out fine. So this was now the second error that we managed to eliminate by plugging in that hard drive fan. So there's a second thing that you will need to also pull from the Dell Optiplex build if you're gonna convert it into a gaming PC. Though, let's tackle now this third error, which is the power cable. And this one I'm a little bit nervous about because I've actually tried to tackle this in the past, albeit I didn't spend a whole lot of time. So after using my gold finger, this is a little tool that I got. I forgot when I got this thing. I think it was sometime back in Japan at a junk store. It's actually, a, I think it's a letter opener, but it's actually got a gold plated tip on it. And so this enables me to use it sort of just when I don't have a power switch on hand or I want to short things out quickly. I managed to short out pins three and four and pressing the power button essentially allowed this to get rid of that power error message, that power cable error message. So the easiest workaround now that I've applied to the motherboard to permanently fix this problem is to get a little CMOS jumper pin. Now these, what they do is essentially they short the two pins together and I've picked these up off a lot of old uh, faulty motherboards that no longer work. And so I always manage to pull some of these pins off. I think they are also on really old hard drives as well, but you can get them for very cheap on eBay. So you will wanna have one of these on hand and I found it just slots straight in and then you can use your power switch like normal minus this error. So we're now three errors down. We've only got one more to get through and this is the front IO adapter and if possible, I would like to not have to put this big chunky front IO panel in the case as it's just gonna really detract away from the build, but also it could cause issues if it's just floating around inside the case. So I'm gonna try if I can not use this connector or this panel and see if I can get around this problem by just doing some, uh, like we did with the power cable, essentially trying to short some pins. So for this next one, I actually ended up cheating a little bit here. And I looked on the internet on the Dell forums because this was, there was so many pins. It was just crazy the amount of pins on this front IO connector port. And so what I found was there was someone back in April, their name was Speedster, and they posted up in earlier this year, a workaround for essentially getting this error message to go away. And what they did was they shorted on their guide, I'll pull it up for you guys, they shorted pins seven and eight together, just like we did with that power cable on pins three and four. 
and they shorted those together and then the error message went away. However, theirs was a 20 pin connector. Ours is, I believe it's a 24 pin connector, so it's slightly different. But then upon looking at the connector itself, I noticed that the two black uh, pins that they were shorting was in the same position. So essentially on this board, it was like they did on their forum tutorial where they had it four from the right. So if we go four from the right and we short the top and bottom pins together, this managed to get that error message to go away. So now when we press the power button, we are booting straight into Windows, no problem. But of course, that leaves the question of, well, Brian, you've got no more IO front ports and you've got no front audio. So what I'm doing for this now is there's actually an internal USB 2 connector on this motherboard and this can essentially work as a front USB 2 out as well. Now, if you need to use USB 3, you can get a USB 3 to USB 2 converter and that will enable your front USB ports to work. But I tested this out with a USB stick and yes, the front USB panel is working. But of course, we've still got that front audio output and also mic input that I would love to get working. So I figured a workaround for this is to just add in a sound card and I've pulled out an old PCI sound card I've got lying around. I've pulled these out of broken PCs and dumpsters in the past. So this for me was free. I've noticed on the internet, you can pick up PCI sound cards for as little as $5. So they're very inexpensive. And since this motherboard does have a PCI slot, it's also got a PCI E slot. So you can get either sound card if you want to, but we're gonna use this PCI sound card since we got that PCI slot and the good thing about this is since the second generation Optiplex I just know by looking at it it is going to have complete garbage onboard audio we're also going to be upgrading the audio on this build as well as getting those front panel audio connectors to work properly so finally let's put this build together finish it off and run some benchmarks and see how it performs After doing a light gaming session on this Optiplex now turned into a gaming PC, I'm happy to report there's absolutely no problems whilst I'm gaming. And to be frank, after seeing the prices of some of these Optiplexes online, where you can get i7, RAM, and everything included, you can end up with a very cheap gaming PC, even if you want to get a better power supply, which you will need to support a higher end GPU. I mean, in this case, we use the GTX 780, but that still does require a 500 watt power supply like the one we used here today. So if you wanna do that, and then of course, on top of that, put the RGB bling in with the build, then this is going to work absolutely fine. But what I'll do is put a quick list of what you're going to need to do in order to get this to work. And that is, first of all, you will need to get the Optiplex, and then out of that Optiplex, you will need to pull out the system fan or that they call it the hard drive fan, which is the smaller one. Then of course, pull out the motherboard, the CPU, the CPU cooler, everything else, but also make sure you pull out that air temperature sensor as well. So there's the two most important things to not have these error messages. You don't need that input output front panel as we found out here today. We managed to circumvent this with pin jumpers. And speaking of those jumpers, you will need two of those to make this go smoothly. So you can buy a heap of them for very cheap, or of course you can just pull them off old builds. So that's the first phase. The next phase of course is to add your own drives. In this case, we already had a one terabyte drive in this build. I just added a 120 gigabyte SSD, add your own GPU, of course, your case and your power supply, and you are now good to go. So in conclusion, converting the Optiplex was pretty straightforward. It's actually not as hard as the HP, which we've done in the past. And also the Lenovo, it's probably on a similar level to the Lenovo, but with the Lenovo's, they are pretty much just straight plug and play. All you will need for them is an adapter for the uh, 14 pin or the 12 pin, and also the front panel audio out. They don't need any sort of jumpers or anything like that, or any extra system fans to work. But that said, you may also need 
an additional 8 pin to 24 pin converter on some of the Optiplex models. I know I have seen some models that don't use that standard 24 pin. So before you buy it, make sure you're going to need that adapter and that might be an extra piece to add on to your build and of course your build cost. But usually these adapters are very cheap on the net. And I mean, in the case of the Novo adapters, I think it's about $5 for the 24 pin adapter. And then for the HD audio adapters, around a dollar to two dollars. So in all, you got seven dollars of adapters. And of course, the beauty of this is that these OEM motherboards, they just come in a whole package for so cheap. And when I took a quick look on eBay, I just found Optiplexes galore. And so when I do my parts hunts now, I'm definitely going to keep an eye out for some of those Optiplexes because we now know that we can do the magic with them and get them working 100%. So that said, I do know this will work with the second and third and fourth generation Optiplexes. Though after that, I'm not too sure. But that said, that's where a lot of the value still is in the used market. Anyway, that aside, I hope you enjoyed today's start to finish conversion of the Optiplex gaming PC. If you did, be sure to hit that like button and also let us know in the comments section below. Is there anything you need to know more about the Optiplex or have you done one of these conversions in the past? Or is there a different uh, style of building PCs that you're onto that's really good price performance? Love reading those thoughts and opinions as always, just like this question of the day here, which comes from Andre Pr Prezorn. Sorry if I butchered the pronunciation, but they ask, are PC power supply units regionally limited? Now they can be, if you look at it in not the term of regionally limited, but more so the voltage that they need for input. In the case of the power supply that we actually found in today's build, that's a 230 volt only power supply. So it'll only work in Australia or uh, countries with that voltage of 230, 240 volts. So a lot of power supplies, however, especially higher end power supplies, they'll be 100 to 240 volt. So they'll essentially work anywhere in the world. So it's not really regional limited, it's just more looking at that voltage input requirement and making sure that it's compatible with your country's power voltages. Anyhow, hope that answers that question and I'll catch you guys in another tech video very soon. And if you stayed this far and you're enjoying that tech yes content as always, be sure to hit that sub button, ring that bell, and I'll catch you in the next one. Peace out for now. Bye.